Okay, so welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jen Swan. I'm the Executive Director at Art Services. Welcome to our fourth week of our Reopening Together series. Um, if you've been with us since week one, you made it. We're at the end, um, so to speak, for the series, uh, but we'll, uh, we'll get into that in a little bit on next steps and what to look forward to. But um, for those of you who haven't been with us uh, in the previous weeks, that's okay too. Uh, today's presentation we're really going to use to wrap up a lot of main concepts that we've talked about in the last couple of weeks, uh, any changes that have come up, um, things that are different from when we started this four weeks ago, uh, any new information that we have. Uh, and then Holly Grant from ASI is going to go through, we sent out a patron survey and we have some responses from that, a lot of good information that we wanna share with everyone because we think it's really important to let everyone know what our audience members and patrons are saying about this, how they feel about reopening and coming back and engaging with us, whether it's through, you know, one-time events coming into our physical venues, uh, because really, you know, we can open our doors once phase four happens, but we really want to make sure that we're listening to those who collaborate and participate with us because knowing how they feel and what they want to do moving forward will also help us really make decisions about that reopening process. Um, so welcome to week four, uh, the, uh, the last for now of this set of series, but I'll, uh, I'll talk a little later about what the future can look like uh, for future presentations uh, if the group feels that there are topics or other things that we need to address at a later point. Um, so we're, we're wrapping up. Uh, we're going to focus on what we've collected through this patron and audience uh, survey. Uh, and then uh, we're also going to have Rochelle from ASI speak later. Uh, we're going to talk about a, a reopening safely together video that ASI is putting together for the field. Um, something that's really collaborative and that any arts and cultural organization can use, whether it's on your social media or at your venues when the time is right for you to open. Just to say that we're all here as a collective sector. We're working together and we're here for both our staff and our volunteer and board safety, but also so our, our patrons and those who come to us and work with us in a lot of different ways. So we're there to make sure that they feel safe as well. Uh, so when you came into the meeting, uh, your uh, audio is muted. So please keep that muted. Uh, we'll hold questions for later on in the presentation. Uh, if you want to leave your video on, you can do that. If you want to see everyone else's faces and wave and say hi and be interactive, feel free to do that. Um, we also have uh, the rest of our ASI staff is on this on this video as well. So we'll moderate and organize your questions or comments. Uh, feel free to put that into the chat box uh, at any time and we'll address those throughout the presentation. Uh, we're also recording today's session just like we have done with the past three. Uh, we'll be sharing that with everyone afterwards uh, and we also will be keeping a, a log of your questions and any conversations that we have so that we can reference that uh, for future presentations as well. And last but not least, before I, I turn it over to Holly, I do want to say that, you know, we, we have a tentative nearing towards phase four, as many of you are, are probably watching the news closely and all of the announcements. Tentatively, phase four could potentially start sometime next week if we are on pace to be there. Um, but there still is a lot of gray area and questions around what phase four means. Um, I've even seen a few uh, newscasts where um, it's not even clear exactly how many and what type of businesses are all included in phase four. Is there, there are a lot of questions around that as well. Um, so I just wanna use that statement to remind our field that just because arts and entertainment is in phase four, doesn't mean that that's a one size fits all, like you've heard me say before. Um, so we're really just hosting this to, to make sure that we continue to look at what impacts phase four and reopening may have on our organizations. And then how can we find out uh, either the right information or existing information to make the right decisions to whether we open our doors now in phase four, later in the fall, maybe in the winter, maybe in January of 2021. We don't know that yet. But um, we want to encourage everyone, you know, do what's in the best interest of your organization and makes the most sense. 
from a staffing standpoint, an operational standpoint, a financial standpoint, um, all of those things have to be working in your favor, right? To, to really say, does this make sense for us to open at this time or whatever time that you decide to open? Um, so if you have any questions that are specific to your organization and reopening plan after this session is over, ASI is always here to answer any questions. Uh, one thing I think we don't mention enough in a lot of these presentations and just in general is that ASI will do one-on-one -on -one meetings, brainstorming, consultations. So if anything pops up and, and you want us to sit down and point you in the right direction or find resources for you, we will do that. So it doesn't just have to be in this collective group uh, presentation and setting. Um, so with that being said, uh, the last thing I'll, I'll just say is that we're not offering legal advice again, as I said before, this is just discussion and idea sharing and really just helping each other out and going arm in arm to figure out what makes the most sense for our next steps. So now I am going to turn it over to Holly Grant, who is ASI's Grants and Programming Director. Uh, she's worked really hard over these last few weeks, uh, not only to craft and put together this entire series, but um, also we sent out the patron and audience survey. Um, and, and many of your organizations have shared that on our behalf, and we thank you for that. We're still sending that out. We're still circulating it. Uh, we're collecting information from our patrons and those who interact and engage with us. Um, but her presentation today is really recapping some large themes and items that has come out so far to date from that survey. And also, I want to thank our intern, Caitlin, who really helped us crunch that data uh, that we have to date. And uh, we have some really neat um, handouts that, that we shared in advance of this uh, that you can really capture some of those numbers and responses and feelings of our audience and patrons. So um, without further ado, I will toss it over to Holly. Thanks, Jen. And hi, everyone. It's good to see you. Um, we, we're very excited to share this information. There is a lot of information. Um, so thank you to those of you who did, um, who did pass this on. I will be sending the information out to you as soon as this is done. Um, I am just going to share my screen here. Um, I did do a presentation. Here we go. To make it a little easier, just because there's a lot of information um, that I'm about to share. Okay, is it working? Not really. There we go. Perfect. Um, so uh, again, thank you for sharing this. We couldn't have done this without you. Um, I will send this presentation, all of the raw data and this great infographic that Caitlin, our intern, um, put together for you to kind of help digest it because there is a lot of information. Um, but we do want to share the raw data with you as well because there is some very information, interesting information in there. Um, so you can really kind of dig in and sort based on whatever information you're looking at, whether it's demographics or certain responses. Um, so before we get started with the really important information of when people want to come back, I do want to take a quick overview of who actually answered this so we know what kind of patron uh, responded and that might help inform how you view this data. So we had 1,397 respondents, 64% of whom live in Erie County. Um, some other regions that were represented were Niagara, Allegheny, Cattaraugus, uh, Chautauqua, Wyoming, Orleans, Genesee, Monroe, and Tioga counties. We also had some from Erie and McKean counties in Pennsylvania and a few from Ontario. We also had a couple respondents from Ohio and Colorado, so I'm not sure who you shared it with, but hopefully they actually do patronize our events here in Western New York. Um, one thing you will notice when you do see the raw data is many people misread this question of what county do you live in and put United States or USA. So you can kind of take those out, you know, being a Western New York arts survey, we assumed that people would either be in the US or Canada, but that's okay. We'll ignore that. Um, so moving on, 60% of the respondents were female. The majority of respondents have two people in their household over the age of 65, 
and 59% of the respondents have an annual income between 75,000 and 250,000. Uh, so we also looked at what kind of art forms and venues they patronize. 95% of respondents attend concert halls, theaters, or other venues that are solely dedicated to performing arts. 65% attend outdoor events, festivals, performances, tours, etc. 58% uh, museums and art galleries. 48% nature centers and botanical gardens. 39% zoos and aquariums. 38% non-traditional performing arts venues, so parks, bars, arenas, that type of place. 35% uh, film and media arts. 24% science museums or children's museums or any kinds of hands-on museums. And only 16% of respondents uh, attend workshops and classes. Um, I want to make a note that of all the responses we received, only 91 people, which is 7% of responses, respondents, chose only one venue type that they patronize. Um, and even within that venue type, they probably patronize more than one organization. I mention this to say that our arts and cultural patron base is very interconnected. We share patrons. So every uh, policy and procedure that you put into place for reopening will impact every other arts and cultural organization in Western New York. Just want to put that out there as something to keep in mind as you're planning. Um, if you're kind of veering off the path and doing something drastically different, um, you know, that could impact how comfortable people feel attending your organization. Um, so what are the relationship to arts and culturals? 85% of our patrons attend multiple programs or events every year. We didn't ask for specification on whether that's the same organization or multiple, but based on the responses, we're assuming most of them are patronizing multiple organizations. 64% are regular members or subscribers with at least one of your organizations. And 22% are employees, volunteers, or artists. Since we targeted this um, to our patron base, I'm gonna guess that most of our employees um, and volunteers and artists did not respond to this. I think it's safe to say that that number is significantly higher. Uh, most of us do patronize the arts, um, whether it's our own organizations or others. Um, we are some of the biggest supporters of arts and cultural communities. So um, we are very, very interconnected once again, just to drive that home. Um, okay, so now let's dig into what the actual data is, right? Um, we, we looked at multiple time frames, um, so from one week to two years. Um, and um, this is, we're starting with the one week, we'll start small and we'll work out. Um, not a surprise, within one week of reopening, 45% say they're very unlikely to attend. Uh, more than half of the respondents are unlikely to patronize your organizations. Um, however, there are some, you know, 12% are very likely to start um, patronizing again. Um, I think this works well for those organizations that are planning to um, reopen fairly early as soon as we're allowed to. I know many of the organizations have laid out plans where they're opening at 20% capacity or some other limited capacity. I think that this plays well to that. Um, this is about what you will see patronizing. Uh, or visiting or buying tickets, attending, whatever. Um, I, I do think um, you should just be prepared that they're not gonna be banging down your door, right? You're not gonna have a line of people ready to go in, so it will be a slow start. Um, but the good news is 12% of respondents are ready when you are. Um, so then we broke it out by the venue type. Um, this is where this the raw data we send you will give you a little bit more information. Um, I don't think this surprises anyone. It's pretty similar. Um, let's see. Um, the, the very likely, the most um, very likely responses falled, uh, fell under uh, science and children's museums and classes and workshops. Um, when you dig into the data a little more, you will notice demographics for those who say they patronize science and children's museums. 
um, over 65, around 65% of the respondents have at least one child under 18 living in their household. So I think it's safe to say that parents are ready to get their kids out of the house and doing things again. So not a surprise that within a week they're going to be ready. More of them are going to be ready to start going out. Um, however, with classes and workshops, um, the largest number of respondents were actually over 65. So I find that a little interesting um, that those people are also ready to start going out and being active and partaking in group activities. Um, so that's encouraging for um, classes and workshops. Um, the lowest number of very likelies that were scored um, fell in venues like concert halls and theaters uh, and museums and art galleries, which received 12 to 13 percent of the very likely responses. So moving into the next time frame, we looked at one month out, one month from when you reopen. Um, at this point, you can kind of see it starting to shift. This is much more balanced across the board from very likely to very unlikely. Um, so people are a bit split on whether they'd be comfortable uh, visiting within uh, one month of reopening. So good, we're getting better, but we're not there yet. Not surprising at all. Uh, when we break that down by art form, um, it's pretty similar. So classes and workshops stays at the top of the very likely to attend. Um, we also see a small spike in um, non-traditional performing arts venues and also the film and media arts. So they rose, um, they're very likely to attend scores rose from the previous one of one week. Um, near the bottom um, remained uh, museums and art galleries and concert halls and theaters. Um, only about 47% of patrons say that they're very likely or somewhat likely to visit those venues. Um, surprisingly, zoos and aquariums were also kind of low on that response. Um, zoos, especially being outdoor, um, it was a little surprising, but you know, they're all fairly close. Um, the range is not that drastic, so not much of a surprise there. So moving out three months, we're getting into the fall, middle of fall. You can see it's continuing to shift. People think that they will be much more comfortable visiting within three months. Um, so more than half of the respondents are very likely or somewhat likely to visit at this point. Um, if we look at um, how that breaks out by art form or venue type, um, the highest number of very likely or somewhat likely fall in the non-traditional um, art, performing arts venues, um, outdoor events, uh, not a surprise, um, and also classes and workshops continues to stay up there. They had about 70% of response of respondents who chose very likely or somewhat likely. Um, the others were close. Um, they all kind of ranged between 66% and 69% choosing very likely or somewhat likely. So not very drastic at this point. Um, moving in the right direction though. Looking at six months out, um, again, continues to move. People are getting more comfortable. This is probably around the new year, start of 2021. Um, people definitely think that they're a little more likely. Um, however, there's still about 10% of people who think even within six months, they're not gonna be ready. Uh, breaking it out by art form, uh, the range is about 75 to 79% of respondents saying very likely or somewhat likely. On the higher end of that, you know, the non-traditional um, venues and zoos and aquariums make a jump here as well. Um, on the lower end, um, we see film and media arts, patrons aren't as comfortable, and nature centers and botanical gardens. I'm not sure if that would have to do with weather or what would be, um, if there's some other outside thing that might be um, influencing that data. Um, but um, overall, it's pretty close across all venue types. Okay, so one year out. So this time in 2021, what are we saying? Even better, um, but as you notice, we're not back to normal. Like people still have hesitations even a year out. Um, you know, hopefully, if all goes well, there'll be a vaccine that's 95% effective and widely available. Probably a little rushed, but 
you know, maybe, but people are still hesitant even a year out. Um, so keep that in mind as you do your long-term budgeting and planning that things are not gonna be back to normal with your patron base right away. Attendance is still gonna be most likely lower than normal unless something drastic changes. So looking at venue type, uh, the responses are around 81 to 85% very likely or somewhat likely to attend. Um, the higher end is science and children's museums, non-traditional performing arts venues. Um, those tend to be higher. Some of the lower ones are film and media arts, museums and art galleries, and concert halls and theaters. Um, but they're all close. They're all within four percentage points of um, responses. So it's not a drastic change within a year, but we're moving in the right direction. Um, and finally, the last one, we looked at two years out, knowing no one has a crystal ball. We don't know what's going to happen next week, let alone two years from now. But how do people feel within two years they would be comfortable returning? Um, better, this is the best we've seen. Um, with a year, it was 69% of um, people saying very likely, and now at two years, it's 77%. However, again, it's not 100%. It's not back to normal. There is still some hesitation among some of them. Um, so looking at the breakout, um, everyone increases slightly for the most part. Um, the highest number of very likelies and somewhat likelies continue to be science and children's museums and non-traditional venues. They're around 88% and 87% respectively. Um, however, something interesting, um, concert halls and theaters and film and media arts stayed exactly the same. There was no change in intention from uh, one year out to two years out. Um, I don't know if that just means your patron base is a little bit more hesitant um, or it's just going to take a little longer. Uh, not sure what's going on there, but there was no change in those. Um, so before we go any further and you're like, Holly, none of your numbers add up to 100%. We also had an option for not sure, for those people who just really did not know how to answer these questions. Um, they don't know it, when they'll be comfortable. Um, so you know, from the very unsure, those who are like, I can't tell you what I'm doing tomorrow, let alone two years from now, to those who are like, well, I kind of have an idea, but I'm not really sure, I'm not really comfortable putting that in here. So there was a group of respondents who um, chose the not sure option instead of choosing one of the others. Um, so just really quickly, quick comparison since I threw a bunch of data at you. Um, here's a comparison side by side of the timeframes and what they chose. And you can see from the one week how mostly it leans towards very unlikely and then it shifts as we go further out, um, going up to two years to the 77%. Um, and again, you know, it never shifts. There's always, there are always some patrons who are very unlikely to attend even two years out. So something to keep in mind. Okay, so what can we do? What do they want us to do to keep them safe? We asked a bunch of questions, um, gave some examples. Um, some things we have control over, some things we don't have control over. The good news is the majority of things people want are things we have control over. So 74% of uh, patrons want you to limit your crowds and attendance. We're planning to do that anyway, depending on the state mandated guidelines, we're going to have to. Um, so that's easy, we've got that. 70% um, want to avoid long lines of people. So looking at a virtual queuing, timed entry, um, if there's a way to continue curbside pickup, depending on the service, um, that would make people feel a lot more comfortable. Uh, availability of a vaccine, out of our control, but that would help people feel more comfortable. 61% um, say of easy, ex easily accessible hand sanitizer or hand washing stations having it everywhere so that if people feel like they need to use it, they can quickly and easily grab some. And 57% say just knowing what your facility's cleaning and safety procedures are would make them feel comfortable. So that's good news. 55% um, did say ability to be outdoors. Some of our organizations have the ability to control that and some don't. 
Um, but if you do, that's definitely something you should keep in mind, especially if you're planning to reopen in the nearer term while the weather's still decent. Um, that, that is a consideration that would make people uh, comfortable. Also wanna point out that 13% of respondents feel comfortable right now pretty much matches up with our, how comfortable would people feel within one week? It was around 12%. So um, just so you know, there, there are some people who are ready to go when you are, which is good news. It's not a high number, but it is some. Um, let me see. Uh, so we did have another option, just an other write-in, like what else would make you feel comfortable? Um, and overwhelmingly patrons um, put, requiring and enforcing the use of face masks and physical distancing. Um, so when you build out your safety plans and your communication plans to the public, make sure you detail that for them. People want to know that, okay, you said you're requiring face masks, but look at all those people over there in that corner who aren't wearing them, you're not doing anything about it. So you, you really need to start thinking about how you're going to address that if patrons don't comply. Um, or once they're in your building, they stand too close to others or something like that. Um, I think also clearly outlining all of that up front may discourage some patrons who really don't want to have to wear masks in public from even attending. I mean, we certainly don't want to shut anyone out, but um, also if you're very upfront, like here's our policy, they may choose not to come back right away. Um, so just another look at similar information. We did ask, why wouldn't you come back right away? What are some things that might prevent you from patronizing us? Um, no, overwhelmingly safety concerns, no surprise. Um, it's aligns with everything else that has been said. And that is why your plans, your policies, and how you communicate them with the public are vital. People want to know. Um, also up there is our personal health concerns. Um, again, as we looked at the demographic information, we tend to have older audience members answering this. So they might be in a higher risk category and that might have influenced this answer as well. Um, loss of disposable income and lack of time are a concern, but are not anywhere near as significant as the other two. But something to keep in mind, knowing many people have lost their jobs and have taken on ad additional childcare responsibilities some people may even have had increased work depending on what field they work in. So um, that will be influencing some of the responses as well. Um, so uh, that's pretty much it. <laughs> that's the presentation. Um, as I mentioned, I will send this and all of the information to you after this. Um, hopefully later today, possibly tomorrow, whenever the video renders and we have the recording ready. Um, at this point, I'm actually going to pass it on to Rochelle Tormino, who's gonna to talk to you guys about um, the communications video that we're putting together on behalf of the sector. So Rochelle, if you wanna jump in, it's yours. Hi everyone. Um, I'm sorry it's so dark in my apartment. We've got a massive storm cloud passing over 14214 right now. Um, yeah, so just briefly, um, as many of you know, ASI has been preparing a reopening video that will be sector wide. Um, the idea came from a lot of conversations that we've been having. We noticed that a similar idea kept popping up where um, there was an interest in having our communications to our patrons be consistent. Um, as Holly said, one of the most important parts of the patron survey is knowing that um, many of them consider us, you know, one community and they're um, attending multiple organizations. It's really rare that a patron is only attending one. So we want to really go back into this together. Um, so we are collaborating with the good people at Squeaky Wheel to create a video to be shared publicly with patrons, communicating that while we're excited to reopen, we're taking these evolving challenges very seriously. And our goal with this video is for patrons to view it and feel comforted knowing that we are communicating that their health is our highest priority ultimately. Um, so 
we are about midway through the preparation of this video and we're at a point where we're putting out a call for B-roll. Um, and what is B-roll? It's images in a video that help to set the scene. So it's extra footage. It's not A-roll, which is people sitting and talking, like a talking head, talking to a camera. It's um, footage that situates a scene um, with, you know, just like people mulling around, um, you know, things that can be cut up so that when the A roll of this video, which is going to be people talking about reopening, um, it's so that it's not just one whole video of talking heads, the B roll will be edited in so it's collaged in and we'll have footage of um, our different arts organizations when they are in operation to, um, you know, signal to patrons um, what they what they expect from our organization, ways to connect with us. Um, so what we're asking is if you have any video footage that you think um, could serve as B-roll, um, just this extra footage for this video, um, we would love to include you. Um, it could be videos from past events like workshops or performances. Um, if you don't have B-roll on hand, it could simply be a video of the inside or outside of your organization, whatever, think, whatever you think helps to tell um, the story of what you do. Um, and, you know, we're going to be trying our best to make sure that all art forms are represented, um, all kinds of organizations are represented, um, and, you know, we really want to go into this with as much of that uh, visual as possible to really um, increase the impact with the patrons who are viewing it. You know, so we want them to be able to identify a couple of the organizations in the video and think to themselves, oh, I love that place. I can't wait for it to reopen. I'm so glad that they're taking this seriously. Um, so I'm gonna drop my email in the chat. Um, we have a pretty hard deadline of this Friday at 5 p.m for sending us this footage. Um, and the only thing is if you do decide to record new footage because you don't have any on file, but you really wanna be part of it, um, you must record it horizontally. So not like this, like you're recording an Instagram story, but like this, like a television. Um, that's pretty much the only guideline that we have for the B-roll. Um, and that's about it. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Jen now, and thank you so much, Holly, for letting me say a couple words, and I hope to hear from you guys. Thanks. Thank you, Rochelle. Um, okay, so before I actually jump into my segment, which I, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, following up uh, what comes after this and next steps, I do want to circle back. We had some questions very specific to um, the survey. So I do wanna pull Holly back in here and see if we can answer some of these questions. Um, let's see. Um, well, not related to our survey, but I, but I do wanna share in case um, anyone missed it in the chat here. Um, Elizabeth Meg from SEPA said she would love to get a survey of what arts organizations or groups are planning on reopening next week fully or partially. Even just a percentage would be helpful to share with members, board members, and other stakeholders. So uh, what we can do on our end is uh, post this, this presentation here. Um, we can reach out and just have everyone respond just to get a temperature check of who's planning on, re, you know, tentatively, I believe it's Tuesday, phase four could potentially uh, go into effect, just who's who's ready to go um, or who's waiting or, and to see what happens. And then that way we can share that with everyone else. So thank, thanks Liz for sharing that. Um, also an, another point that I do wanna bring up is with our survey results that we just shared with everyone, um, we do plan on using, that's, that can be used in, in a public platform, um, and I'll touch on it a little later uh, when I start talking about advocacy and communicating with different um, communities and those that we work with just on how we're basing our decisions on reopening and our plans. So we, we do encourage everyone, you know, we collected this information so that you could use it both for internal planning, but also if you wanna share it, whether it's with a funder, um, sharing it with 
with your patrons and your audience members or just talking about it with your staff and saying, you know, here's kind of the direction these stats are going in. Um, this is how we're going to put our plans together. We encourage you to use that. Um, but the survey is still open. And so this isn't the end all be all. So we'll still be collecting information. So the data will be growing and changing as we get more responses, but uh, we, we do want you to be able to use it. So it helps you in whatever way you see fit. All right, um, let me just scroll through here. Okay, so we have a question about statistical analysis. Was there any statistical analysis done on this data? Most, most of this variation doesn't look like it would be statistically significant. Um, Holly, I'll, I'll defer to you since you were working <laughs> within SurveyMonkey and, and kind of crunching all that. Sure, yeah, um, it's, uh, no, I'm not a data analyst, so I, I've not done an in-depth um, analysis of this information. Um, I also just kind of crammed it in over two, two to three days um, to try to make it streamlined so you can see trends. Um, I will provide, as I mentioned, the raw data to you, so if you want to dig in and do more of an analysis, you are more than welcome to. Um, it is a pretty small pool. Um, it was less than 1,400 respondents. Um, so, I mean, I guess that speaks to who actually shared this um, and how it was shared. Um, but yeah, I mean, no, I'm not a data analyst. I did not do in-depth analysis, but you are going to have the information. So please feel free to use it however you need. Thank you. Um, Arnold did ask about masks, but I, I believe when he posted that in the chat group, that was right when you went into your, your discussion about masks, even though it wasn't on the one slide. So uh, we definitely addressed that and how patrons will feel about mask wearing and, and coming into a space, whether indoor or outdoor. Uh, Kathleen Bassett at, uh, is talking about outside events. So if you plan an outside event this summer, keep in mind that you could potentially draw large crowds since there are very few opportunities out there. Will you be able to control the crowd? Will you be relying on public safety forces and consider these to consider these variables? So I don't know, Holly, if, if you experienced anything through the feedback uh, no, but I think that that speaks to a lot of what we've been talking about over the weeks. You know, you definitely need to keep that in mind um, when you are planning. You need uh, a way to do contact tracing. So you have to have information for everyone who participates in an event. Um, do you have security or staff that can help control? Um, is the space you're using able to be fenced off in some way so you can control streams? So I think she brings up a great point in just considering those things if you are going to look at an outdoor event. Because as we saw in the data that people do feel a slightly more comfortable if they can be outside, but there are other areas of concern that you have to consider. Okay, thank you, Holly. That, that looks to be the question specifically from the survey. So I actually, um, I'll jump off actually Holly's last point, because what, what I want to talk about is really, um, you know, not only what are next steps, what should we anticipate? Um, like Holly said, we don't have a crystal ball, so we're doing our best based on feedback from everyone working in the field, you know, temperature checks with the organizations, with the patrons, um, but also I, I want to share a little bit about what we potentially could do once we go into phase four and, and what the field collective, collectively could look towards. Um, so what, the, what I do wanna point out is, of course, after this, as I mentioned before, ASI could always put you in touch with access to other resources. Uh, our website and our blog posts uh, on, our, on our main website, really, we continue to update those multiple times a day. So we're always focusing on, we actually built out an entire section for COVID related resources. And that's a, a couple different areas, uh, financial planning, uh, state guidelines, reopening, county resources, PPE. Um, so we're just constantly adding to that. So if you checked it this morning, it'll probably be different tonight when we have more resources to add. So feel free to use that as, as your guide and really digging in. But as I mentioned before, you know, just give us a call, shoot us an email. 
we'll work with you one on one. If you just want to go step by step through something, we're more than happy to help you where we can provide that information. Uh, so one of, one of the things, I guess, that's a, a little more streamlined that we started doing is that uh, if we start seeing a trend within either a specific artistic discipline or kind of category or theme, we're more than happy to help facilitate any conversations. And I'll, and I'll use the example, uh, we actually, uh, this week, we're meeting with multiple different choral uh, and we've also opened it up to singing ensembles, so that could be opera, musical theater groups, to really get together and have that specific artistic discipline get together and have a conversation about what this looks like and how this is impacting their activities, their planning, and just and, and using that as a way to share with each other. And the reason we came to that uh, that decision to really get choral groups together is we started having conversations about, you know, there's the Theater Alliance of Buffalo. And so a lot of the theaters can get together and share their ideas within their own sub, you know, sub discipline of our sector, uh, because they have some very different challenges and, and expectations and things to think about rather than say, you know, someone who's working in the visual uh, arts community. And so with the choral groups, we wanted to get them together. So if you are part of a choral group, uh, and that's again, choral or singing ensemble, opera, musical theater, we do have uh, a conversation, a coalition that we're having on this Thursday, June 24th. It's at 2 p.m. And uh, if you're interested in attending that and being part of that discussion, uh, feel free to contact Holly directly and she can add you to that. She'll be leading that discussion. Um, but in addition to that, you know, we, we started talking about, and, and I know this isn't just specific to choral groups, but it's really what got us thinking uh, at ASI about the different kinds of COVID impacts on those groups is really the medical resources and the stats, right? So you're thinking about, you're projecting, um, you can't wear a mask while you sing. Um, you know, six feet is actually not enough distance when you're singing or performing or you're on stage. So thinking about how that's a different kind of environment than if you're just sitting next to each other in a room or you're spacing out because you're working around a table for a workshop or a drawing class, for example. Um, so we, we've been able to compile some medical resources and articles that are specific around vocal and singing and really just as, as much as we can collect that information and data and be able to share that with the field, um, the better informed we'll be to make, make the right plans and the next steps going forward. Uh, so the, the other group and facilitation we're, we're doing, uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, ASI's Arts Access Program. And so many of you uh, on this call right now are, are members and have been are your partners and you've been longtime partners of the program. And for those of you who are not familiar with what it is, um, we have every year we put out applications for what what are called pass holders, so arts access pass holders. And these are for any individual or families that are receiving some kind of income-based public assistance uh, in Erie and Niagara counties. And uh, they can apply to get an arts access pass. And then our 50 plus arts partners in the program offer in some way, shape or form uh, free admissions. So it could be two free admissions to a theater performance, or it could be a monthly admission to a museum or gallery. Um, really each organization chooses what that, uh, what that ad admission for that arts access pass holder looks like. But we know that this is going to be a huge challenge this year because even right now, usually our arts access timeline is we, uh, we re-up for the new season, uh, lining up with the theater season, right? So starting in September. And so we go September through the following August. But right now we know a lot of groups, they haven't planned for their 2021 season. Uh, I'm so, yeah, the, yeah, the 2021 season. Um, you know, some groups are waiting until January 2021. And so we want to have a real conversation about number one, you know, how can that program still help connect our arts groups to audiences through this COVID situation, but also the the idea of arts access in general is changing drastically. So what we once thought as an accessibility barrier is being financial and transportation, which is why we created the program to help 
get over those barriers for individuals to attend arts events, um, we have a whole nother set of challenges. So we're, we're actually hosting a partner meeting tomorrow at 11 a.m. for all of our current partners. But for anyone who's interested in having that conversation and maybe potentially being a new partner or wanting to have that conversation about arts access, um, you know, a few weeks ago, we even talked about how the libraries are really a, a great source of community for a lot of our arts access pass holders because they'll go there to use the internet and the computer to fill out their application to find out what's going on in our arts and cultural world. Um, but if they're not open in the way that they used to be now, some of the libraries are open. Um, you know, how do we continue to connect and virtual isn't always the answer and especially for a lot of those pass holders. Um, just because you're having virtual programming doesn't mean that that is accessible to them. So this is a whole new level of arts accessibility in general. So I do want to invite you to, to both of those and that's really kind of how ASI is envisioning what the next steps are during this process of it's not just reopen and bye, we're never going to see you again, you know, you're on your own. We want to make sure that we're providing these platforms and these and these discussions so that as they pop up, we can address them and work together on them. Jen, uh, I can just jump in for a minute. Um, one thing uh, Jen kind of mentioned, um, as after the guidelines have come out and been released and we all have a chance to digest them. We will probably host another session with everyone just to have a conversation. You know, what are the questions? What are the concerns that have arisen after you've had a chance to look at these? Um, you know, we don't know who's advising the state on these. I assume they have advisors in the arts, but that doesn't mean that it's going to work for every art form. So um, we will be checking in. Don't think that just because this is the last one we're done. We're here for you and we will be in touch. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Holly. No, that that was great, and it actually ties right into what I'm what I'm about to say. You know, uh, we're the experts in our specific artistic discipline, and you know, the next steps moving forward would be that the state and the county are providing these safety guidelines. Um, we're waiting to hear the details on what's really included and expected within phase four. Uh, I used the example of phase two actually a couple of weeks ago, where you know, phase two, a lot of a lot of the hair salons thought they knew everything that they needed. And then if, you know, about a week or a couple of days before, uh, a lot of salons realized they also needed face shields, which, which they didn't realize up until right before. So just being nimble and flexible um, and, and really thinking about the details in reopening in phase four, how does that have an impact on each of our organizations? And really that's where ASI wants to play a role because we, we want you to think about uh, your operations and how, whether that's day-to-day, event-based, activity-based, think about what that was pre-COVID. Now you're going to take whatever details, whatever guidelines and information comes out in phase four, you're going to take that and lay that into your operations. And you, you really have to take a deep dive into, okay, so I'm adding this to what we already do so it's not only layering it into how your operations were pre-COVID, but it's also, there are some things that you may just have to change altogether or get rid of altogether because it doesn't make sense in a phase four environment. Uh, but where I think that we could help is once the details of phase four come out, you know, beyond what we presented in this series, uh, as we look at it and think about our very specific organizations and how we operate our day to day and our events and activities, there may be things that make sense and they fit in and you can accommodate and you could be flexible and you can figure out how to work that into your operations that took place before. But there may be some things that you're sitting there scratching your head and going, I have no idea how this is going to work or this doesn't work for X, Y, and Z artistic discipline. Uh, this doesn't address my kind of venue or my kind of performance or my kind of artwork. Uh, those are the kinds of questions and conversations that we want to have at ASI because that'll really lead us into um, potentially having uh, a larger conversation on an advocating level. So if it's that, you know, phase four is, it, it says arts and entertainment, but it includes a lot of other sectors as well. And so being mindful about 
how ASI can take this collective information. And if something's not working, and we think it's either not feasible or maybe it, it just, it's not advisable for what we're doing in this particular nook of the arts and cultural sector, then we need to know that because then we have to put something together so that we can have a conversation, whether it's on the county level uh, or the state level to say, you know, have we specifically thought about these different areas of the arts and cultural sector? Uh, how can we make this better? Or how can we work together? Uh, and, and for those of you who are familiar with ASI and our work, we, we do a lot of different advocacy efforts. And it's really just a matter of looking at what a certain situation is, being mindful of it, and making sure that the arts and cultural sector is being represented uh, in the many different facets that it's represented. So for example, um, Many of you received an email from me weeks and weeks ago in, in relation to the uh, New York State Council on the Arts 2021 budget. So uh, this is a good example of an advocacy effort where we said, okay, well, we're in 2020 and we know that the state is having some budget challenges. Uh, so it's realistic to know that the New York State Council on the Arts is a department of the state. And if there's statewide budget deficit for 2021, that's going to have an impact on that NISCA funding. So we collectively started contacting those who received NISCA funding this year to say, we're putting a letter together to send to Governor Cuomo to say, when you're considering changes to your 2021 budget, please don't wipe the arts out of that. You know, we, we are, you know, and here we are and just making sure that everyone remembers the impact that our sector has whether it's on the economy, on education, on you know all of our jobs and all of our lives, uh, we just want to make sure that we're collectively taking up those efforts. So in the same way, uh, I, I guess my takeaway for phase four and the guidelines is that next week, ideally, they'll come out, we'll be able to look at them. And so what I really want to do at that point is have everyone kind of look at it, absorb it, um, you know, let us know, is there something that's just way off base that doesn't work or that's really going to have a really negative or a really positive impact on your organization? Let's, let's have a conversation and talk about that because then we can start putting together, you know, if this starts to be larger and sector wide, then we can take steps to have those conversations on a higher level to make sure that our sector is represented in the most appropriate way uh, within those phase four guidelines. Um, and that also includes, you know, I mentioned, you know, are there any major challenges, something that doesn't quite fit? Do you feel that your organization is left out, even though you're under the umbrella of arts and entertainment? Do you feel like whatever information in those guidelines that came out is just completely irrelevant to your line of business and what you do? We want to know that. Um, so that's really, you know, to be determined uh, potentially next week. So that's kind of the next steps that we're looking at. And as Holly mentioned, you know, we'll do follow up discussions and presentations on anything that arises from that. So just, just be on a lookout for that. But mostly that'll come from you. We don't know that something's missing or something doesn't work or something's awry unless you tell us. So, so please, you know, we have an open door, let us know. Uh, so lastly, you know, what to do in the meantime. So I just want to encourage everyone, you know, the, these guidelines, we're going to interlay into what our post or our pre-COVID operations were, right? So we're filtering in these new guidelines, these new safety measures to make sure that everyone is comfortable, uh, that we're doing our due diligence to take care of both our audiences, ourselves, our staff members, our supporters, our volunteers. Um, but in the meantime, you know, keep doing, even if you're not opening, on day one of phase four, which I haven't heard much of anyone say that they're doing that. Um, it may be a, a few weeks out from the opening of phase four, you know, no one seems to be in a major rush because um, they're really crunching the numbers and crunching and, and figuring out, you know, what makes the most sense for our organization. So I will encourage everyone in the meantime, you know, keep going through your cash flow, do it now through year end, do it now through mid 2021. Um, run your best case, your worst case scenarios, because as phase four starts to peel back, it's almost like an onion, you know, we're, we're going to start peeling it back and saying, this works, this doesn't. Um, there may be a capacity limitation. You may say, well, I could do this event in phase four, but the capacity limitation just doesn't make sense for, for me to do this right now. Maybe I'll wait until that capacity limitation changes or increases or weighted out a little bit based on the audience and, and the patron survey responses. 
Um, so just be smart about what it means to reopen. Uh, balance your expenses and your cost of reopening versus the opportunity for your revenues, right? Does it make sense? Um, and just really consider your role in protecting your staff, your volunteers, your board members, and the public, because we, we all have that role. And I think, um, I think most of us are compassionate, compassionate humans that, you know, this, this is the sector that we work in and we, we want to help everyone through the arts, but we, we don't want to rush it if it doesn't if it doesn't make sense. And so we have this role of protecting everyone in our community through our art forms and what we offer to our community, but we also have that role in protecting them um, and, just, and just being smart and, and healthy and safe. So lastly, before we address any of the other questions that have been submitted, uh, one specific uh, offshoot of discussion that we, we probably will have, but don't hold me to it right now. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about, and actually it was um, Jen um, from the Albright Knox who really talked about de-escalation training. So Albright Knox is a great example. They're doing this with their staff and, and it's such a, a great point to be made. Uh, we talk a lot about you know, what happens when we reopen and somebody comes and they're supposed to wear a mask and they don't, uh, how does our staff approach that? Our staff, our volunteers, um, anyone who's there, you know, how do, how do we handle that? And, and how do we go through that de-escalation training? So we've been having some conversations around that. And I think really that's one of the topics that are coming up as we really think about the reality of reopening. Um, so ASI is working on um, getting someone in that we could potentially do a de-escalation training for organizations, for your staff, for whomever you feel that is going to be interacting with the public once you reopen so that um, we're all understanding, you know, how do you do that? It's a difficult thing, you know, nobody likes confrontation, but also, you know, the same thing, no shirt, no shoes, no service, no mask, no service. Um, you know, I, I think just on a day-to-day -day basis, we don't normally have to approach anyone coming into our arts organizations without a shirt on or without shoes on. Um, so this this will be definitely a, a different environment, but a uh, training that is most definitely needed. So uh, look for that in the near future as we kind of hash that out. Uh, so if there are any other topics, please let us know. We can identify other series to, to move forward with and other conversations, uh, but that's just one example of what's come out of this to date. Um, so I will stop there. That was a lot of information. Uh, I do want to circle back. I'll bring the rest of the ASI team in here. Um, I see there's some chat discussion happening. So do we have any last minute questions, concerns, comments? ideas, anything uh, like that. I'll jump in. Uh, Jennifer had a question about a uh, requirement for contact tracing from the state, asking whose authority they could point to if they get pushback. Um, we'll have to wait for the phase four arts guidelines to make sure, but in all of the guidelines in the first three phases, there has been, um, it has been a requirement that the business track some kind of contact information, whether it's a phone number or email of every person who enters their building. Um, and if someone in your venue does contract COVID, it is your responsibility to notify the state and county health departments and to notify every patron who was in or employee, every person who was in your venue at that time. So we anticipate that will stay the same. So yes, you can blame the state, <laughs> assuming that doesn't change. Um, Cindy uh, commented about the maximum number of people in a gathering being 25. That's the last I heard as well. I don't know how that changes for organizations, but yeah, at this point, the maximum gathering size is 25 people. So keep that in mind as well. Um, I, I guess I'll, Holly, if you don't mind, I'll throw kind of an add-on onto this, right? So that's kind of a blanket I personally, I feel that's kind of a blanket statement, right? Like gatherings of 25, but what does that really mean? So it's like, I run an organization that I'm having a class or a workshop. Um, does that apply to me? I run a small theater company. Does that apply to me? Like, are there different levels of what that gathering of 25 means? We don't know at this point. Um, and we don't know if the guidelines will address that either. And so I think that's, you know, as Holly said, one of those things that we won't know until we can actually see it in writing what it says and then start to think, oh wait, this doesn't work or this does work for my organization or wait, I have 10 more questions after this. You know, how do we address this? 
Definitely. Um, Hillary had a question to theater directors about physically blocking off seats and what you're using. Um, I know there were there was a little bit of comments in the thread, but um, if anyone wants to talk about that, I guess you could unmute yourself and talk about how you were doing that. Um, thinking about, um, you know, for any um, larger events, um, screening films, um, you know, trying to use reserved seating, but you know, people move, they don't like their seat, they wanna be closer, they get up and move. Um, so if anyone has any thoughts, jump in. Um, you can also put it in the chat box. And I think that was the last. Oh, uh, Courtney, a few weeks ago, it was mentioned that there was a group working on signage and posted guidelines to share. So we all have a consistent message. Yes. <laughs> We need to circle back with her and see where that stands. So we will get that to you. <laughs> Thank you for the reminder. I think that's it, unless, uh, Jen, you see anything? No, I don't. I don't. I know there's a lot of conversation. So we will kind of pick through. We want to be mindful of your time. We're four minutes over. I know. I know everyone's on Zoom calls and phone calls, um, but uh, yeah, I guess I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll close it out by saying thank you so much. You know, you could have been anywhere. You could have been on your patio hanging out with your cat or your dog, or, you know, you, you chose to be with, with us talking about reopening. And I, I think that says a lot about our field, those who work at our organizations, those who volunteer at our organizations. Like we're, we're committed, we wanna do the right thing. We wanna have the right information. Um, so, you know, we really appreciate you for all the time and effort and everything that you've done in preparing your organizations. You know, this has been a really, really strange time. We went from being completely closed and dark and not knowing what to do and, you know, not having events and activities to go to in the evenings and the weekends to a place where we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel, but it's, it's a, it's a new normal and we're trying to figure out how that fits. Um, but we're really happy just to, to be here by your side. And as, as I always say, you know, ASI doesn't exist without the field. And so we're more than happy to do whatever it is that we can to help you out and, and be there and get through this together. Um, yeah, we'll be, we'll be following up and we have this recording and it was great to see everyone and uh, we'll be in touch and, and let us know if there's anything else that we can do. So thank you. Thank you, Holly. Thanks everyone, take care, we will follow up.